Hi guys, my name's Nico Block. In only four days from now, there's going to be an election in Britain, which, uh, to my mind, is one of the most important elections in British history. I don't, well, I don't know, in, in my life, probably. Uh, there is, you know, there is an impending crisis uh, looming over the island that has to do with Brexit, as we all know. Um, and for the first time in a very long time, Labour has real leadership, real left-wing, real socialist leadership uh, in Jeremy Corbyn and the, uh, and the movement that's propelled him into that position. Um, you know, for that reason, I hate to think what will happen to his position as leader of the party if he doesn't uh, do well in this election. That's something, no doubt, Leo will talk about. Um, Leo himself just returned from a trip to England where he was canvassing for labor in London and Yorkshire. Um, he also went to the labor conference where you presented, um, speaking about momentum, I believe, and uh, other things. You'll get into it. Um, what else is there? That's really it. Um, the other thing to mention also uh, is that four days ago, Leo published a, a very short article in the Toronto Star, which uh, I thought was a very effective, very kind of succinct rejoinder to the campaign of slander that has been uh, aimed at Corbyn on the charges of his anti-Semitism, which are obviously very cynically motivated by the right and also uh, uh, exploiting his, uh, his progressive and sensible position on Palestine. Thanks okay, you. without further ado, we have Hanch. So I know most of you uh, probably want to hear uh, what the likely outcome will be next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, without a crystal ball, who knows? But let me get some of that out of the way and so we can go on to talk about uh, you know, longer run trends and uh, uh, what could come after the election no matter what the outcome is. The general run of the polls show the Labour Party behind 10%, uh, which would, uh, if that played out uh, right across the country, would yield a majority for Boris Johnson and the Tories. Uh, that said, there's a very interesting website which you might want to be trying to follow the next few days called Stats for Lefties. <laughs> Look it up. Uh, and uh, they've just done a, a interesting report based on week four of the campaign, which uh, says that the same pattern appears to be developing as occurred in the 2017 election. In fact, in week four of that election campaign, uh, Labour was 13% behind May's Conservatives. Mm. And now they're averaging 10% behind, and with a similar trajectory. So that uh, whereas uh, Corbyn and the Labour Party stood in the low 20s uh, in May, they're now up to 33% and moving up in the pool. Uh, if you talk to people who are out campaigning, as I do all the time, uh, they are not pessimistic. They're pessimistic about getting a majority, but they feel that the same thing is happening as happened last time. Uh, and they tend to believe uh, that either they will deprive Johnson of a majority and then he'll be in the same position as May, um, or that Labour could actually turn out to be the largest party, uh, uh, but of course not have a majority itself. Uh, my gut feeling is more pessimistic uh, based on what I've seen there in the four times I've been there this year. And I'll talk about why that's so. But that's the general position now. And it's certainly the case that people are not despondent. I mean, there is a tremendous amount of mobilization, um, especially among young people uh, in this campaign. Uh, and, and this takes place <coughs> partly through the party itself and very largely through momentum. 
which has raised uh, half a million pounds since the election began. Uh, and that's not unimportant in terms of the future either because they're not going to spend anything like that. But they now have 55 full-time people working on this campaign in momentum alone. 17 of them doing videos. And, you know, what you don't see when you read The Guardian uh, is you know, what is, is passed around on social media. Um, and, uh, you know, I pleaded with people I know in, on Corbin's team, in Momentum, and in Unite, the union, the largest <coughs> union, that they take out a full page ad in the newspapers this week uh, using a tweet from a female doctor, which was absolutely brilliant in the kind of sardonic, British, ironic way, uh, which, which, which began with, when did it, uh, Jeremy Corbyn become an anti-Semite? <laughs> and she used the first fact that I used in that piece of the star, was it when he organized the defense of the Jewish population of Wood Green against the neo-Nazi march in 1977? And then she went through many of the things that he had done up to 2016, 2017 in this tweet. And if you actually, I thought, put it in the new full, full page of a newspaper ad as a tweet <coughs> like that from a you know, woman doctor in her 40s, it would have a hell of a lot more effect than something written by a white, male, old, Canadian, Jewish academic in the star. <laughs> um, and and uh, what I got back from one of the founders of Momentum, who is now the main speechwriter in, and main media link in Corbin's office, James Schneider, was uh, we find that ads in newspapers aren't effective. Uh, and there's a lot of this going on in social media, which is effective. And, you know, maybe that's true because it is the case that the whole of the working class, I mean, I didn't realize this, is on Facebook. In the North, in the Midlands, in Yorkshire, they are. So if they're reaching them, then maybe things, maybe my gut feeling, which is very pessimistic, for reasons I'll talk about in relation to attitudes in the traditional working class in, in those areas that I have come across. Uh, makes me feel pessimistic, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Um, I think it's important to put this in a longer historical perspective. Every one of the great capitalist crises over the last hundred years, the 1930s, the 1970s, and uh, the Great Recession after the 2008 financial crisis, has produced a crisis in the Labour Party, uh, ideological and organizational. Uh, and it produced that crisis because leaders of the Labour Party were all complicit in uh, the reactionary ways that uh, the crisis was either seeded or responded to. And out of that crisis, in each case, a previously marginal figure uh, on the labor left, a parliamentarian, but a previously marginal figure on the labor left, uh, emerged as leader of the Labor Party. So the first of these was uh, after 1931, at the beginning of the Depression, when there was a minority labor government, and Ramsay MacDonald uh, uh, formed a national government with the Tories and the Liberals because he couldn't get uh, the 265 Labour MPs, they were the largest party but not a majority, to support him in introducing a massive austerity program <coughs> involving the cutting of unemployment benefits and social benefits, uh, given that in the Depression, of course, government uh, fiscal means were increasingly constrained their own incomes were heavily constrained, so governments everywhere, until Roosevelt's New Deal, and even then he wasn't much of a Keynesian, um, were actually cutting back on expenditure. Uh, MacDonald was convinced this uh, was necessary, and he joined with a few la labor MPs, national labor MPs, they were known as a national government. <coughs> uh, there was an election immediately after he did this, and labor, the Labor Party 
the majority of labor MPs and the whole of the party apparatus wouldn't go along with this, the unions wouldn't go along with it. But labor was reduced to some 50 seats as McDonald aligned with the Tories and the Liberals in every constituency against labor. Uh, the party took a sharp turn to the left in the wake of that. Uh, and uh, uh, a marvelous old pacifist socialist George Lansbury, who had cut his teeth as a municipal socialist in the early part of the 20th century and then was a pacifist during World War I, etc., was elected leader. Uh, he lasted three years. Uh, he resigned as leader. He felt that the traditional parliamentar parliamentarism of most labor MPs uh, constrained him horribly in terms of linking up with the mass unemployment marches, etc., that were taking place in the early 1930s. It was the Communist Party that picked that up. Uh, his conventional career parliamentarians, uh, centrist MPs, didn't. Uh, and he resigned in 1935 when the Labour Party conference voted for military rearmament. Uh, to support the government, the military rearmament. He was a pacifist. He resigned. Clement Attlee became very much a centrist, social work centrist, became leader of the Labour Party, installed the responsible team. That eventually went on, and they, they lost an election in 35, but in 45, uh, the time the next election was held after the Second World of War, of course, uh, Labour formed the government. Uh, but it was not a radical socialist government. It instituted the welfare state, but it was a, a fairly conventional social democratic government. In the crisis of the 1970s, when uh, the labor government uh, introduced the social contract, uh, wage restraint on the unions, and that was under Wilson and then under Callahan, uh, during the IMF crisis, reneged on full employment, reneged on the Keynesian welfare state explicitly, uh, there was an uprising inside the Labor Party uh, which had been designated as the New Labor Left, or the Labor New Left, led by Tony Benn, uh, and a struggle led by a campaign for Labor Party democracy was begun uh, to democratize the Labor Party, to subject the parliamentary party uh, to control by the party conference and the red, more radical resolutions it was passing, et cetera. Um, out of that, uh, after the defeat by Thatcher in the 1979 election, a very se someone who was seen as the far left of the party traditionally, Michael Foote, um, who uh, was one of the leaders of the campaign for nuclear disarmament, uh, had been a far left wing uh, Bevanite MP, very much formed under Lansbury in the early 1930s. Uh, he entered into an alliance with the center right of the MP, uh, of the PLPs, of the MPs of the Parliamentary Labor Party, uh, in order to prevent Tony Benn from getting elected leader of the Labor Party. Um, uh, and and uh, in that context, then, uh, the Labor Party opted for someone who had been previously marginal uh, to the centrist Labor MPs. Um, uh, uh, Tony, Tony Benn didn't become leader. Uh, they ran in the 1983 election, and despite not having the Bennites, having defeated them, uh, they did extremely poorly, not least because uh, the center-right Labour MPs continued to leak into the public urinal right up to Election Day, hmm. with Dennis Healy, who was the deputy leader by that point and had been for a long time, the foreign minister and defense spokesman and treasurer, the week before the election, he said he would not support what was in the party manifesto, which was to get rid of the nuclear weapon, the one nuclear weapon that Britain has, the Trident Summit. Uh, that manifesto, which was a very left-wing manifesto in Labour Party terms, largely written by the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy and the Bennites, but with Foote's attachment of unilateral disarmament in it as well, was designated uh, after that election as the longest suicide note in history. Uh, and a previous leftist, uh, someone who used to be very much associated with Ben and the CLTD, 
became leader of the Labour Party, quoting Gramsci, uh, having Eric Hobsbawm introduce him at fringe meetings at Labour Party conferences, saying what we need is a popular front against the quasi-fascist Thatcher rights, etc. Uh, he turned on the labor left in a very venomous and vicious way and against the miners in the 1985 strike uh, and paved the way for uh, the third wave for Blair and Brown uh, uh, 10, 15 years later. Out of the crisis of 2008-9 and the decade of austerity imposed by the Tories after they were elected in 2010, uh, you got a rejection of Blairism by Ed Miliband, who's an ethical socialist but a very pragmatic politician, uh, a rejection of the Iraq War, and uh, a call for paying much more attention to inequality. Uh, but uh, he, he was elected by the union vote. Uh, he didn't have the support of the vast majority of MPs who were mostly Blairites. Uh, and he gave priority to keeping the Labour Party unified hmm. rather than radicalizing social democracy as he promised. Hmm. Uh, what he did manage to do, uh, very much under pressure from the unions, was change the basis for electing the party leader to one, pr one member, one vote. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, with people allowed to sign on as supporters uh, for three pounds and vote for the Labour Party leader as well. And when he lost the 2015 election, uh, uh, he resigned immediately, and every one of the MPs who declared themselves as a candidate said that the reason that we didn't win uh, was that we looked soft on austerity. It, we didn't look like we uh, really were credible in terms of balancing the budget. Uh, and secondly, we weren't aspirational enough. Aspirational meaning, you know, you appeal to the working class's hope that their children at least will be able to get out of the mess that they're in. Uh, in that context, uh, Corbyn became a candidate for the leadership. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a tiny group of MPs who had lived through this long era, who represented the project of the neighbor, labor left from the 70s and early 80s. He was one of them. It was called the campaign, uh, the Socialist Campaign Group. Uh, the only reason they didn't leave the Labour Party was because, like in Canada, they have the first past the post electoral system. Had there been PR, had there been proportional representation, they, like much of the left of conventional social democratic and communist parties, uh, in continental Europe would have broken away, gotten re-elected because they could have gotten four or five, six percent of the vote. And they would uh, have been a socialist party outside of the Labour Party. But insofar as within first past the post you can't do that, they stayed in the Labour Party. About 20 of them. Uh, and uh, none of them wanted to run. They didn't think they had a chance of getting enough. In order to run, you had to get 35 Labour MPs to sign your nomination papers. There was only some 20 of them. They never thought they'd get a chance. Uh, but a campaign started out of a social media group called Red Labour, uh, which had be begun in 2012 by some young people, uh, uh, to get one of them nominated. And they started putting pressure on their MPs to at least sign somebody's papers. And they kept saying, no, I'm not going to do this. What's the point of it? McDonald said, I've had a heart attack. Diane Abbott, the black labor MP, uh, said, look, I tried it in 2010 and got nowhere. What's the <laughs> point? Uh, and finally, Corbyn said, what about me? And everybody thought he was the least likely person to do it because he was the least parliamentary, the least oriented to a careerist, being a careerist politician. Uh, he was always a campaigner. He always used being in Parliament as a soapbox to go out and campaign in, for social issues, including being chairman of the Stop the War Coalition, heading up uh, what was left of the campaign for nuclear disarmament, etc. Et and not least of all, of course, uh, heading up campaigns for Palestinian justice and rights, at least since the 1981-82 uh, Sabra and Shatila massacre. 
So he got nominated, and lo and behold, uh, once he was nominated, a incredible movement developed. Uh, begun out of this social media group Red Labor, but spinning off uh, into what became Momentum, um, and just galvanizing uh, those people, particularly young people, who had been very active in the anti-globalization movement, in the Stop the War movement, which was the biggest in Britain of any country at all, and, and was led by a coalition of trots and communists. Hmm. Uh, with Ben first as chairman of, of the Stop the War and then Corbyn as chair after uh, Ben died. Um, and, and the anti-austerity movements, which were very creative in Britain. involved a lot of occupations of stores and welfare offices and so on. And all of these people who wanted nothing to do with party politics mm -hmm. came rushing in to support. Corbyn Labour became the largest party in Europe with 500,000 members. That's not even counting all the supporters who paid three pounds to vote for him. Mm -hmm. um, and on the basis of the one member, one vote electoral system, he was elected leader. The majority of the parliamentary party saw, thought that was a disaster. Uh, within a year, uh, there was an attempted coup with 90% of the MPs signing an open letter after they denigrated him at a private parliamentary, uh, Labour parliamentary meeting, uh, signed a letter demanding his resignation. Uh, the main reason for that was they thought they couldn't win elections uh, with someone like Corbyn leading the party. The other reason uh, was first that he had refused to sign on to the bombing of Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in February of 2016, but also because of the Brexit referendum in uh, June 2016, uh, uh, which, you know, Corbyn had opposed Brexit as early as 2012. He had, in a very visionary way, when Cameron had promised the Tory right that if the Tories were re-elected, he would have a referendum on the European Union. And they could feel that their heels being snapped at by the UK, the UK Independence Party by that point. Um, he promised a referendum, and Corbyn had said then uh, that it may, even though the Labour left had always been quite critical of the European Union as a neoliberal capitalist outfit, uh, that it might be necessary to support the European Union in that referendum insofar as it would be led by a xenophobic campaign, which it was, with an anti-immigrant uh, theme being the dominant theme in it. Although the main concern of the people who are now in Johnson's cabinet, young Tories, as they made explicit in a pamphlet they wrote called Britain uh, unchaining Britain in 2012 uh, was that in order to get the British economy going again they needed to become a Singapore in the North Sea and uh, being tied to the European Union's labor standards made that impossible. They were very explicit about this. Dominic Raab, uh, Pretty Patel, uh, they were the people who wrote that path. Uh, Corbyn had, therefore, uh, said in his appearances, uh, look, I'm only 7 out of 10 uh, for the European Union, uh, but, you know, he, he supported Labour Party policy in opposing it. Uh, the uh, referendum went 52% against the European Union, 48% for, with a very large part of the working class electorate. Uh, in uh, the north of England, in Yorkshire, in the Midlands, uh, voting for Brexit. And this was a vote against the status quo. As elsewhere, uh, it reflected a certain know-nothing, xenophobic, anti-immigrant uh, sentiment that was played on by the right, uh, sometimes in areas where you've never seen an immigrant. In the 2015 election, UKIP was getting 10, 15,000 votes in Welsh constituencies. 
which had voted labor through the whole of the 20th century. They weren't electing them there. But that was the number of voters that were voting for UKIP in places, you know, in the Rhonda Valley that don't see an immigrant. Part of it had to do with the running down of the NHS, with the closure of libraries, with the closure of fire stations. Um, and, and people were very open to the charge that people who hadn't paid taxes were be coming to Britain and taking advantage of the NHS at a time when the emergency wards were bursting at the seams already. And people are open to that kind of appeal when they've heard nothing le less uh, else, else for so long. So there was an attempted coup against Corbyn which forced another leadership election which he won with an even larger vote. <laughs> um, and, and that produced an enormous sense of uh, exhilaration uh, on the part of the young people who had been mobilized behind him in particular. Uh, the momentum grew in numbers to 50,000 um, and uh, it spun off a marvelous cultural and political event called the World Transform uh, at Labor Party conferences, which <coughs> turned it from being a boring place where resolutions are presented and debated to a very exciting cultural uh, and, and political debating event. So much so that all of the media and most of the delegates were going to the World Transformed events mm -hmm. and not spending enough time <coughs> at the Labor Party debating important questions. Mm -hmm. um, this gave a tremendous fill-up then to what happened in 2017. Uh, and that was May, uh, Elizabeth May, having replaced Cameron after, who resigned immediately after the referendum, because he had expected that uh, Europe would, would win. Uh, he thought it was a smart move on his part to get this out of the way, and he failed. So he resigned, Elizabeth May was chosen leader, and she had a policy of Brexit means Brexit. Uh, and uh, uh, she uh, called an election expecting uh, that with Corbyn leading the Labour Party, sharing the view of most center-right Labour MPs that if a socialist leads a party, they're unelectable. <coughs> Especially if they're a socialist who's so unpatriotic as they want to get, hold, get rid of the uh, nuclear submarine that Britain has, which they couldn't use without the Americans okay anyway. <laughs> But if you don't support that, you're not patriotic in the British media. And in the eyes of the British establishment, including virtually all mainstream labor MPs. Uh, and, and Corbyn has personal po popularity. He's not, unlike Ben, his mentor, he's not a very good retail politician. He's a poor debater. Uh, he doesn't speak fluently. Uh, he doesn't think fast on his speed, feet in a 25 second sound bite. Um, that's one of the things that made him attractive to young people, that he was kind of the anti-politician politician. politician. Right. Um, so she expected she'd win a massive majority and be able to see Brexit through. And she also thought she'd be able to see it through by making it less of a sharp break with the EU that wouldn't be so costly to the British economy, especially to the city of London. Uh, which is the financial hub of all of European uh, bond markets. Uh, and as I've already told you, that turned out to be completely wrong. Uh, and, and despite what the polls were showing, up to the last week, a 13% Tory lead, etc., uh, Corbyn increased the Labour vote to just over 40%. Miliband had only had 30% in 2015. This was the largest increase in two successive elections for the Labour Party since 1945. Uh, it was done on the basis of a re very radical manifesto with a slogan from Shelley, uh, for the many, not the few, uh, which uh, went over extremely well. Uh, it it uh, was was the most anti-austerity 
uh, set of pledges, uh, the least apologetic about the need for deficit spending, um, oriented to a revitalization of British industry through nationalizations of public utilities, uh, uh, through uh, a national and regional investment bank, um, which would uh, borrow very heavily in order to invest uh, in those regions in particular that have been devastated by deindustrialization uh, since even before Thatcher, but especially after Thatcher. Corbyn came to the Labour Party conference after that election and said this. It is often said that elections could only be won from the center ground, and in a way that is not wrong. So long as it's clear that the political center of gravity isn't fixed or unmovable, nor is it where the establishment pundits like to think it is. It shifts as people's expectations and experiences change and political spaces opened up. Today's center ground is certainly not where it was 20 or 30 years ago. A new consensus is emerging from the great economic crash and the years of austerity when people decide start finding political voice for their hopes of something different and better. 2017 may be the year when politics finally caught up with the crash of 2008 because we offered people a clear choice. We still need to build a broader consensus around the priorities we set in this election, making the case both for compassion and collective aspiration. That is the real center of gravity of British politics. We are now the political mainstream. Hmm. Uh, and he claimed this was all the more important given the fact that all around the world, democracy was facing twin threats. One is the emergence of an authoritarian nationalism that is intolerant and belligerent. The second is apparently more benign, but equally insidious. It is that big decisions should be left to the elite that political choices can be only be marginal and that people are consumers first and only citizens a distant second. Democracy has to mean, mean much more than that. It must mean listening to people outside of election time and outside of parliament. Well, a, there was a paradox to how well Labour did in that election. The paradox was that it meant that May couldn't get Brexit through. Hmm. She couldn't get it through because Corbyn, rightly, pledged himself, and he has been very consistent on this, to wanting to, because he only sees the European Union as seven out of 10, if we were gonna be uh, uh, in it, we would have to reform it. But if we're gonna be out of it, which he, on the whole, that team around Corbyn was happy to see Brexit go through, but only if the labor standards, which are much higher in the European Union because of the traditional strength of the European working class and European social democracy, and the human rights standards, remain written into British law. And secondly, insofar as there was a close customs relationship, since you know, Britain doesn't export all that much apart from financial commodities, but what it does export, 50% of it goes to the European Union. Uh, and a great many of the service jobs, you know, the jobs in the tourist industry, etc., cetera, uh, are tied to the European Union and the travel that working class people take to Mallorca and so on, right? Uh, so the policy was that we would uh, try to negotiate a customs union. And the closest thing to a single market like the Norwegians have, but with some control over the free, free flow of capital and the movement of labor. That was their position. Uh, insofar as May now couldn't get her deal through, she had to either get the type of Brexit that Labour would support, hmm. uh, or uh, uh, the type of Brexit that the right in the Conservative Party would support. Hmm. And what they primarily went, wanted was to get rid of those Labour standards to get rid of the European Courts of Justice, very important role in terms of sustaining human rights. So this became an impossible situation for her to really get Brexit means Brexit through. 
and where labor voted for what she came back with, a very large portion of the Tory party, including in her cabinet, including <coughs> Boris Johnson, uh, voted against. Uh, and when she then moved to the right uh, in, in uh, saying we would uh, try to get a tougher, harder Brexit, Labour wouldn't support it. In that interim, the polls started showing that the vote might switch in a second referendum from 52 to leave, 48 to remain, the other way around, 52 to remain, 48 to and in that context, the Blairites in the Labour Party, Blair and Mandelson, and a significant portion of the Liberal Democrats, funded very heavily by the financiers of the City of London, began a new campaign called the People's Vote Campaign for a second referendum. And the majority of the parliamentarians in the Labour Party, uh, especially those that weren't representing Leave constituencies, uh, uh, became became convinced that it had to become Labour's policy that they would support it. <coughs> this long, drawn out, intra-parliamentary procedural battle <coughs> had the effect of trapping Corbyn and the socialist leadership inside Parliament. Hmm. Precisely what Corbyn said about needing to go outward democratically, he was not able to fulfill. And he's not very good at this. He's rather desultory when he stands at the uh, question box and reads what he has to ask. Uh, when he was first elected, he used question period to actually come with letters he'd received from Labour Party members and read them, and they were terrific. Uh, as he was now trying to balance the majority of the PLP that didn't support him and was pushing for a second referendum, or a portion of it uh, that was so concerned about their uh, losing their, their votes in leave constituencies uh, that they wouldn't even countenance a progressive Brexit, if you like, uh, he increasingly became trapped inside Parliament. And in any case, as we know very well, uh, you can very easily get trapped inside the bubble of parliamentary politics, where all of the focus of the media is on question period, is on what the leaders come out of Parliament, the House of Commons, and stand in the mic speaking to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you could see even the radical leadership in the leader's office becoming trapped in the Westminster bubble in this context. What happened, in, especially amongst the working class vote in the Midlands and South Yorkshire, in the North, which had voted to leave as a protest against the status quo, was they became very hostile to what they call the establishment elite in London that is not listening to our vote. You know, the fact that, you know, 70 percent of uh, labor constituencies voted to leave gave them this feeling, even though it was a 52-48 vote. It was close enough in labor heartland uh, that 70% of Labour constituencies were with me. They largely ignored the fact that in London and around London, in Scotland, in Wales, uh, there was nothing like that. Uh, and and uh, Remain voters voted for the Labour Party, not as extensively, but nevertheless did. Uh, so, you know, if you came along and said 90% of the people in Islington and London voted to stay, uh, to someone in Yorkshire, they would say, well, you know, it doesn't bother me, we voted 52%. You're, this is the only thing we've got, we've got democracy. Here in hmm. um, before the election was called, I mean, May was done away with, as you know, because she couldn't get this through, Johnson pulled off the coup. 
uh, utterly cynical in almost every respect, uh, but very much aligning with those young Tories who want Brexit for the type of reason that they articulated in that pamphlet in Unchaining Britain in 2012. Um, called an election, uh, but even before the election was called, I went campaigning, as I said, with Ed Miliband in Doncaster North. That is a, a constituency largely made up of mining villages. And you actually drive through a lot of rural areas to get from one to another on the outskirts of Doncaster. These were areas which were at the heart of the miners' strike in 1985. Every one of them, the main community center in those towns, in those small, very small towns, is known as the Miner's Social to this day. The pool tables and the pub, etc. And I have to say, it was shocking. <coughs> I mean, that's I went because Ed had been telling me what he was experiencing. Uh, and especially from men in their 50s and 60s and older, including people who are responsible for keeping the minor social going, who talked very positively about having been on the picket lines if they were old enough in 1985, would say things like, we know that Thatcher uh, sent in soldiers wearing policemen's uniforms to break the strike, etc. he would say to them, you know, uh, how do, what do you think of Corbyn? He's terrible. Why? He's an IRA supporter. He supported terrorism. Uh, in what's, you know, if you try to talk about that rationally, all he really did was say we needed to meet with Sinn Féin. Right? Uh, which, of course, Major and Blair then did ten years later, but he said it ten years before, for which he was produced in all of the media as an IRA supporter. About 10% of people in those constituencies that would have gone into the mines went into the army, not surprisingly. Hmm. That attitude reflects this. Uh, more than that, we, you know, the appeal that uh, we've been ignored, uh, the appeal of we have to get Brexit sorted, the sense that the London establishment is screwing them comes out extremely strongly. It comes out less from people who work in the public sector uh, who are, tend to be more women in any case. There remains a deep loyalty of a tribal kind based on generations that have told them not to vote Tory. But the Brexit party, which is now the party that UKIP used to be, led by Nigel Farage, doesn't fit those tribal loyalties. It's outside of having been told we never vote Tory. So walking past a pub doing canvassing, one guy stuck his head out and screamed, we're all Farage here. Hmm. Wow. Currently, the polls are showing that 70% of people who voted to leave are supporting the Conservative Party. 48% are now who, vote, who, who uh, voted to remain are now supporting Labour as compared with 20% who are supporting Liberal Democrats. And that will fall even further. Most of them have now opted for what Corbyn's position has been, what the Labour team's position has been. And I'll try to end by explaining this. Under the pressure from the Labour Centre right to have another people's vote, Corbyn insisted this would be to betray those Labour voters who voted to leave and who had good feeling to be against the neoliberal European Union, even if not xenophobic grounds for being against them. So Corbyn, their position has been that we would negotiate a close link along the principles that I identified. And we would bring that back then to a referendum. And that was the only way in which he could keep unity in the Labour Party. At the Labour Party conference, that the resolution, the National Executive Committee statement to that effect, and a resolution from one of the unions, two of the unions, as against a, a different resolution which called for Corbyn to demand 
a second referendum and to the claim that labor part, the Labour Party would stand with Remain in that referendum. Corbyn's position was endorsed overwhelmingly. And it was really interesting. I was on a panel, a young Labour panel, uh, and uh, co-organized co with Unite the Union, the largest union. I was on with Len McCluskey. There were 150 young labor members there. I mean, really young people. You have to be under 26 to be in the young labor. And McCluskey, who, you know, is, I don't think that great a speaker, he got up and he said to them, what are you? Now, overwhelmingly, they're for Remain. If you're young, you want to be able to travel easily in Britain, in, across Europe, etc." He said, what are you? Are you Remainers? Are you leavers or are you socialists? And as one person, as one person, they got up and cheered. And then from the floor, a lot of young delegates went to the mic at the debate, where the, the question was being debated, these resolutions were being debated, went to the floor and said, one of them said it first and it was picked up, we're not for the 52%, we're not for the 48%, we're for the 99%. And Corbyn put that into his speech, etc. Because there was a furor over it being so obvious by a show of hands that, that the Corbyn's position had been passed, the, those people who were organizing the Labour Must Support Remain position, the second referendum, etc., started screaming for a, a, a card vote. Right? They didn't get it. And as a result of that, the Guardian's headline the next day was chaos at the Labour Party conference. Huh which is how it gets filtered in the press. Okay, so this is where we are. Again, a very good manifesto has been produced, in some ways more radical. It's connected now to, it's called a green industrial revolution, so all of the stuff around the investment banks, uh, uh, regional uh, reconstruction, uh, planning agreements, uh, which are hinted at in there, um, are, are uh, uh, still there, and nationalization has been extended beyond the traditional utilities, water, uh, 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 oil and gas, um, uh, uh, railways, uh, the post office, Buses, to broadband, to broadband, to basic internet services, which is treated as a basic public need in the manifesto. Corbyn has proved to be right that this is now common sense. It had started with May already, but Johnson is running on the basis of promises to put $46 billion into the National Health Service. Nobody is talking about a balanced budget. Nobody is talking about a balanced budget, right? Uh, he's talking about hiring 20,000 nurses that would only replace all of those they got rid of, of course. Right? 20,000 policemen should replace all those they got rid of, etc. But th in that sense, in that sense, which is still not the case in Europe, right? The Social Democrats are still on what's known as the Schwarze Null, the black zero, the no deficit in, in Germany. You see the demonstrations against Macron, right? As he's introducing traditional austerity cutbacks in pensions. Right? In Britain, it is true that on the social issue, this has had the effect of shifting where the center ground is. But on the issue of Brexit, that's not the case. So, I'll end with this. It is unclear what's going to happen. Even if the people in Momentum who I speak to are right that it's a labor minority government that will happen, which my gut tells me is not going to be the case. But if they're right, and they're much closer on the ground than I am, and in some places they're getting 800 people out doing canvassing, you know, it's, and they're young people who go to Momentum training sessions, I did one with them. Uh, you know, 40 young people turned out to, you know, to figure out how to talk about this stuff. How to handle the appalling anti-Semitism charge, right, uh, etc. Um, 
even if they do become the largest party, he would have to form a government with the Liberal Democrats, with the Scottish Nationalists, and with the majority of the Parliamentary Labour Party who still are not socialists. What they haven't managed to do is to change the basis for reselecting MPs. Mm -hmm. And even if they had done that, it would have involved so much bloodletting in the Labour Party that it would have been an incredibly divided party in the run-up to this election. So, he'll, the leader, uh, socialist leadership's government would be extremely limited in terms of what it would be able to do in such a circumstance. It would probably only be there to reintroduce a second referendum, which the SNP and the Liberal Democrats and the majority of Labour MPs uh, would opt for. Uh, so we have to look more long run than this. And in long run terms, I think things look a lot better. The campaign for Labour Party democracy at its height in the early 80s had a thousand members. Momentum has 50,000 members. Hmm. Even if only 10% of them are active, that's 5,000 people. In the campaign for Labour Party democracy, there were probably 50 who were really active. You know what we call movements, right? if we're honest to ourselves, uh, in terms of who's doing this stuff. Um, it's not impossible that a new centrist party will form out of this crisis in British politics. Uh, Johnson has already expelled some of the leading One Nation Tories. Uh, the Liberal Democrats are proving themselves not to be a viable centrist party again. And if the Labour left can retain the leadership of the Labour Party, and they are looking past Corbyn as who might be able to do that, uh, then a good chunk of the center-right Labour MPs, the main ones, may leave. If such a party, it would be kind of the guardian party. Uh, they'd get enormous good press. Uh, if the left retained control of the party apparatus, which it's likely to do because the unions are still led from the left, uh, and have been since the early 2000s, it could be the basis for finally turning the Labour Party into a democratic socialist party rather than a social democratic one. Uh, it would have to involve being able to take the world transform and turn it into a vehicle for political education. Not least in places like South Yorkshire, where the minor socials are, where no political education goes on and hasn't, you know, really since the late 40s. Uh, it's not impossible, but it would require, although, you know, McCluskey can make a great intervention like that, and a really important one, you know, are you Remainers, are you Leavers, are all you Socialists, and has a great effect. The unions themselves do not do any political education. They are not internally bureaucratic, they're democratic. McCluskey was re-elected on 12% of the membership vote. So if this were to go anywhere, it would not only involve uh, democratizing the Labour Party, which in many ways is still very bureaucratic. The reason there have been so many expulsions on the ridiculous anti-Semitism charges, which are essentially just, as someone said anything critical of Israel, or claim that Zionists are racist which is playing with fire a little when you say this to people who are labor Zionists, who've been associated with the Labour Party since 1918, and you call them a racist because they're a Zionist, it's not surprising they get sensitive. But, you know, people have been expelled for saying things like, why don't we commemorate the Holocaust along with other holocausts? So, what's so terrible about that? Right? People have been not allowed to run again for saying Labour overreacted to this charge. And they've really been on their heels in the face of all this. And all of those party bureaucrats who have been this since the Cold War days of the early 1950s, they've had one good talent, 
and they, that remained the case after Blair replaced the old ones with his new ones. They're good at expelling people. <laughs> and, and the anti-Semitism thing has meant that they've been able to play with it this way. But, you know, one could, you know, good people have been appointed. There's now a campaigning group, campaign group inside the party, which is doing very good at grassroots work. Good people, some of the founders of Momentum, have, are now inside the Labour Party apparatus. Uh, and one could see this possibly changing. Uh, but it would need uh, the unions to play a very much more active, democratizing, and political education role uh, than they do now. I'll end with that.